My name is Craig Maloney, and I will be talking about automating the mundane. Yay! Yay. So, uh, as soon as LibreOffice cooperates with me, I will be presenting to you. All right, so I will be talking about automating the mundane. So first off, what does automating the mundane mean? Well, let's break it apart. First off, let's talk about automation. For a lot of folks, the first thing that comes to, when they talk about automation, the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about automation, because we are in Michigan, obviously, is the automotive companies. Big industrial machines whacking away at and welding away at various different machines and various different parts going down an assembly line. That's one thought for automation. But we've been doing automation for a very long time. We're really good <coughs> at automating things. So you have something like a windmill, you know, which is basically wind-powered milling stone to grind up grain and whatnot. So automation doesn't necessarily have to be a whole bunch of complex machinery. It can be very simple machinery uh, that gives us great results. So let's talk about mundane. What is the mundane? Well, some of you may be very familiar with the mundane in your day-to-day -day work. So it won't go too much into the mundane. But one thing about mu the mundane, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with the myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is a Greek myth. Um, basically, he spent all of his time down in Hades pushing a boulder, rock, whatever, up a hill. And then at the end of the day, the rock would come falling back down, and he would have to, on the next day, go hoisting this rock back up the mountain, day in, day out. That is kind of mundane. It's a repetitive task really doesn't push anything. There's no real progress in this. It just keeps pushing the rock up. Rock keeps falling down. Push it back up. Push it back down. All right. One of the other things in mundane, now this is a, uh, in the Wikipedia page for a librarian. Uh, you've got a gentleman over there writing down, copying down a book. Very repetitive. Basically taking the letter up top, putting it down in the scroll below. Take the letter up top, scroll below. You know, day in, day out. Does he look happy? Probably not. I mean, maybe fulfilled. I don't know. Maybe it was fulfilling work back then. Inspired. Inspired. <laughs> so when we combine them together, automation and mundane, what do you get? Well, when I was younger, uh, I had this really interesting idea of what automating mundane was going to be. And this is partially because of selfish reasons. I wanted, in the worst way, the Hero One robot. <laughs> I was convinced, I was trying to convince my parents, that we needed a Hero One robot because it was going to do a lot of mundane tasks. My parents, who did not drink whatsoever, I was saying, you know, this robot could serve us drinks. It's like, that's a really great idea, but it doesn't really fit. I mean, first off, 1980s technology, actually getting the thing to move in a straight line was probably a feat. But, or actually picking something up, you know, was probably a feat. But, you know, that, that was my idea. And of course, there was, you know, all these different things. I mean, basically, I could have been happy with any one of these things. Um, but yeah. So what is automating the mundane? I'm going to keep getting around to that. But one thing that we will explicitly ignore is this. And a lot of people, when they think of automation, they think of deployments. That seems to be the hand-in-hand the -hand thing when people talk about automation is how do we automate large-scale deployments? How do we automate continuous integration? How do we integrate getting from point A to point B? And we're going to ignore all of that. If you want to talk about Ansible, Chef, Salt, any of these things, I'm going to ignore all that stuff. What I am going to talk about, well, maybe this should be a better title. Ta-da! Shell scripting the mundane. However, it's not all about the shell either. So maybe it's just, you know, scripting the mundane. But nobody would have been coming here if it was just scripting the mundane, you know? Let's face it. Scripting is not really all that, you know, cannot always be that interesting. When you talk about automation, it's like, ooh, big, you know, big test. Scripting, not so much. But what we will focus on in this talk is doing meaningful work and offloading the mundane and the repetitive work. So, in your day to day, you know, a lot of people, you know, sit at their desk and they're kind of frustrated. You know, it's like as as you go through your day, there's all this stuff that piles up that you need to take care of. 
They're not necessarily the fun tasks. They're just kind of the things that you need to get done. And yeah, you can hammer away at your keyboard all day in that, but maybe there's a better way to do stuff. So why would we want to do this? Well, an oversimplified and somewhat scientific sounding reason for this is to conserve calories throughout the day. And when I talk about calories, I'm talking about a unit of work. And there's a, there's a fancy definition for what exactly a calorie is, but I'm just going to use that as the idea. The, the idea of this is a unit of work. Every decision that you make counts against your daily reserve of calories, your daily reserve of being able to make decisions. And as you wear through the day, your ability to un, uh, make these deep decisions and whatnot wears down. And so in order to get to the point where you're not wearing down all of these decisions and whatnot, you can automate some of that stuff, pull away that stuff, so you're not burning all of these calories trying to remember how to do something really simple. So how do we decide what to automate? Well, one law, well, let's call it Craig's Law, or actually more like Craig's really neat rubric, if it's the first time that you're doing something, just do it, okay? If it's the first time that you're doing some task, <coughs> just do it, okay? There's no real need to automate it. If it's the second time that you're doing it, automate it, okay? And if there is a checklist for it, and you've been in organizations where they have these lovely checklists of all these things that you need to do in order to make something happen, if there is a checklist for it, consider automating it. And I'll talk about one of the reasons why that may not necessarily be the best thing, but definitely consider automating that. So how would you decide what to automate? Well, first off, is it something that can be reproduced with little or no human input whatsoever? The more human input that you have into something, the more that somebody says, oh, I trust my gut in order to do this. Oh, I need to talk to such and such about this before this can proceed. The more human interaction you have with this, the less likely you're going to be able to automate it. So if you can reduce that, that is one way that you can automate this stuff. The more decisions that the computer can make, the more decisions that aren't outside of the computer's domain, the more you're going to be able to automate it. Is this something that you're going to do repeatedly? And again, if you're doing something the second time around, consider doing the automation for that. Uh, and is it something that you do not enjoy doing? You know, if it's something that, you know, Opening up an Excel spreadsheet or something like that so you can throw some numbers into that, and you know, there are numbers that you grab from somewhere else. Is that really what you want to do with the rest of your life? No, probably not. I mean, the less that I open up in an Excel spreadsheet, the happier I am. So, you know, you can ask yourself, and yes, Marie Kondo's been all over the darn place, you know, the KonMari method, but does this task really spark joy? And so when people talk about sparking joy, you know, there, there's all these things about, you know, keeping 30 books and all this other kind of stuff where they try and reduce it. But what it is, is, is this the life that I want to be leading? Is this something that I want to be doing in my day to day stuff? So when you think about it, it's like, is this something that I want as part of my day to day work? Does it spark joy? And if you look at your your task list and it's like this stuff doesn't spark joy, then maybe you need to consider offloading that. And by the way, you're sitting in front of a computer, so offload it to that if you can. So the process of automa automation, and what I'm gonna, I'm gonna split it up into the verbs and the nouns. So the verbs are the actions. What does this task do? What is the thing doing in this? So if you split it up into the verbs, then you understand what it's doing. If you split it down into the nouns, you can figure out who it's for and what do you need to make it happen. So if split it up into verbs, what does it do, and split it up into nouns. Who is it for? Where is it going? All that type of stuff. So let's do, um, so describe the, ta uh, the task and notice the verbs that you're doing. So here's a particular contrived example. I get the numbers from Bob via email and turn them into a report that gets sent via email to the customer. This is one of my jobs that I had. And relatively speaking, it's not necessarily this particular exact thing, but there was a Bob and there were some numbers and those got turned into a report that got sent to the customer, okay? So what are the verbs in there? Well, the first verb is get, I get the numbers. 
Second verb, I turn. I turn those verb, those numbers into a report. And then that gets sent over to the customer. The report gets sent to the customer. So the nouns of this, Bob. Bob is the person that has the numbers. Great, let's go find Bob, get those numbers. The numbers are in the report. The email is how I receive those numbers. The report is created, magically. And then the email is sent to the customer, the final recipient of all this stuff. Those are, the, those are all the, the nouns in this particular thing. Now, if we dig deeper into that, we think about what questions do we have? Well, first off, where does Bob get those numbers from? How is Bob getting those numbers? OK, that's a good question. Is Bob the only source of these numbers? Do we have to necessarily go through Bob to get numbers? Who's the customer? Hmm, that's a good question. When is this needed? That's usually a good question for, for folks. It's like, you know, when is this needed? When do you need to have this by? And especially if it's a repetitive task, when does this need to be happening? And what time does it need to be on your desk? What is the text of the email that gets sent out? Is this still needed? I don't know how many organizations have all these processes where they don't ask the question, is this still needed? There have been many times where I will go and ask about something and invariably it's like, oh, well, we don't do that anymore. That's not something that we're doing any longer. And it's like, well, we've been not doing what we need to do for you know however long that we've been doing this. All right. So more answers in our contrived example. Bob gets the numbers from a database. Well, huh, family that, funny that. I can get numbers from a database probably as well as Bob can. Maybe Bob doesn't need to go and get those numbers from the database. We have access to the database. Huzzah! We don't necessarily need to go through Bob. The report is in Excel. Yeah, OK. Uh, the email message is text is copied from a template. OK. The customer is glenda at example.com. All right. Well, Glenda is going to be getting some email probably from this automated process. The email is sent the first of the month by 5 PM. Hmm. That's sounding like a cron job to me. Yes. Have you had problems of the Bobs with this? I've had many problems with a Bob. <laughs> and I will get to problems with Bob. Okay. Yeah, no, I, look, I'll, I'll talk about Bob as soon as I get through my contrived example. Okay. So what this suggests is that, huh, there's a Python script to grab the data directly from the database. So I can use something like SQL, Alchemy, Postgres, you know, something along those lines. The output I can throw into Py, OpenPy Excel. So that is a Python module that allow you to write and read from an Excel spreadsheet. It's a really cool thing. Um, I use it extensively. I'm not really going to cover it in this because I hate Excel. But that's another thing. And then email it using an email library in Python. OK, looking, looking pretty simple. So if you always dig into the problem to see what happens throughout the life cycle of process, you can find some more answers to this. But if we dig deeper into this, what is Gretchen or Glenda looking for? Well, Glenda converts the data over into their database. Why are we throwing into an Excel at all? If it's just going into a database, why bother with that stuff? So she converts it over into a CSV file. She doesn't care about the formatting. She only cares about the consistency. Bob, however, cares about the formatting. Bob throws in extra lines at the top of the file. Bob throws, you know, puts things over one column over. And I, yes, we had a Bob like that where the, the numbers, I literally wrote up one thing where it would go through and find the first 10 lines, try and find the header line, and then start from there. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of people like Bob, God bless you, Bob, uh, who would throw a lot of stuff into those, those files that weren't needed. Mm -hmm. But Glenn has been clinging to Bob for several months about keeping the data consistent. Because Bob likes to throw a little extra formatting in there, likes to highlight things, likes to throw all sorts of stuff in there, and it's not needed. All she needs is a CSV file. So we took our complicated Python script, throwing it into Py, OpenPy Excel, throwing it into an email, and we turned it into something like this. Because in our contrived example, we're using Postgres. In our contrived example, we can throw it into a CSV file, and then use MUT. And all we need to do is cron up a MUT so that it grabs that particular thing, 
and then shoots it over to Glenda. That's a simple automation right there. So you throw it in cron and you're done. So we replaced Bob's complex task with a simple shell script. Yes? Can I shoot some holes in it? You may. So my concern with something like that would be that when somebody created each of those processes, mm -hmm. Bob Yes. That's I, I will I will talk a little bit about that, and that gets into the human element of this. So no, 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 that's fine, and and it's probably as good a place as any to talk about the human element because if you have something where Bob is actually making decisions about what gets thrown in there, then you have you have to try and systematize that. Well, I guess I, I was more referring to that's outside of the mundane. That's outside of the mundane, but yes. Right. Put us out of business, and then before it makes it into the customer's system, just a quick check to make sure all their automated processes. Right. Accurate. Sorry, no, 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 and, and and that's perfectly that's perfectly fine because um, and and this gets into the human element of this. So if there are things where you have to check things, where if there are things where you have to incorporate different. Uh, different pieces into the whole scenario where you're going through and it's like, okay, a human needs to get involved here, a human needs to get involved here, then that's going to complicate things. That's going to add additional steps into this. What this contrived example, again, is, is basically trying to show that you can take something that involves several people that doesn't necessarily need to involve those several people if you think about it. But yes, there are certain instances in certain companies where, yes, they, they go through and it's like, we need to make sure that all these numbers are correct. We need to have a verification script. But you can also look at systematizing that. And it's like, okay, if the only verification that we're doing is that we're making sure that this column over here matches these averages or some other thing like that, why not just throw in the averages in there and then double check it against another thing and, and have the computer do that sort of verification for you? So that's one approach to do this, is that the more steps that you throw into this, the more you want to take a step back and say, what is it that we are doing? And then see if we can systematize that. But that's, yeah, that's a good point. That in this, again, this is extremely contrived. But this is basically one of the uh, reporting scenarios that I had for one of these things, where it's like it was sending out reports, and the reports were basically MySQL running a CSV and then emailing that over to someone else or throwing it into a directory and zipping it up, as opposed to going full on and trying to you know, create these really beautiful templated Excel spreadsheets. And some customers do want a very nice templated Excel spreadsheet that they can pass around to everyone else and they can say, yay, verily, that's exactly what we want. So I, we've talked enough about the contrived example. So what makes a really good candidate for automation? And this gets back to this. You need to have consistent sources and destinations. You need to have the consistency. If you don't have consistency, if things get screwed up, then you're going to have to try and either correct for that or you're going to have a harder time trying to automate this stuff. You need to have a clearly defined processes and goals. What is it that we are doing and what are we trying to accomplish? If you don't understand what those are, then you're going to have a really hard time. You need to have no, no human decision making because the computer, every time that you ask a, a human being to intervene in all this stuff, you run into trouble, okay? And again, the decision making can, can be something like, you know, gut decision making or these numbers don't look right or something like that, don't send them over. It involve human beings as little as possible and only as needed. So if and, and yes, invariably there's going to be something where it's like you're going to look at this and like the numbers don't make sense because, you know, we've got percentages that are more than 100% and that's not possible. But you can also say, well, look, there's a rule, 100%, and then have the computer go through and say, this report that I just generated, it's bunk. Go ahead and take a look at it. That sort of thing. And then tasks that can be simplified using default behaviors of existing tools. This is important 
And I can't stress this enough. If you can find tools that will allow you to use the default behaviors, so something like you know a Postgres with where it will accept, execute a command, that's awesome. If you have something where the default behavior is that it just it outputs a CSV file, maybe use that for that. And sometimes this this takes a little bit of the uh, the human element of persuasion, which is, hey, this particular thing does this now, and we're not going to have to pay to do something really cool with this. Is this okay? Is this going to be enough? And sometimes getting to the point where it's enough is going to be the way that you can move forward on a lot of these automation decisions. Things that are difficult, inconsistent sources and destinations. Again, the Excel spreadsheet where the headers are maybe you know, anywhere between one and 10 rows down. Uh, Ill-defined processes and goals. So we don't necessarily know why it is that we're doing this particular thing. Or this month it's this particular way that we're doing it and the next month it may be something else that we're doing and, and so on. And things that consistently change. And a lot of organizations have a lot of churn and a lot of people with a lot of churn have very interesting ideas of how they want things to work. So what worked last month may not work this month. The I know it when I'll see it or I trust my instincts decisions. You cannot systematize this to save your life. So again, push back on this and say, what is it that you are actually looking for in this? What is it that when you look at this particular data or this particular process, what is it that you are saying, no, this isn't right, or yes, this is right? And tools with a purpose built or no interface for import and export. So one of the tools that I uh, worked on was a survey tool where they threw all of the data into a database that worked for the way that they were pulling the data out of it. It did not work very well for trying to export the data out of it at all. So I was going to various different tables and various different columns and whatnot, trying to find all this stuff and pile it all together so I could figure out what was going on. Please, for the love of God, if you have any say whatsoever in the tools that you are using, try and find something that at least has better import and export capabilities than just going into the database and trying to join up a whole bunch of tables and whatnot. So enough said on that. And obfuscation. Uh, some companies are really fond of making it so that you cannot get into their databases and, and, and into any of their processes. So um, one of them in particular that I'm thinking of is something like Remedy, um, which was a, uh, a tool, tra uh, a ticket tracking system. And they wanted to sell you all these wonderful products and whatnot so that you could do all the export through all of these different tools. They didn't want you hanging around in the database. And of course, they made it slightly more difficult to get into the database so that you would do that. Any tool that goes through the trouble of trying to keep you out, for the love of God, please try and find a different tool or just try and understand what it is that they're doing. You know, sometimes we can't pick our tools. So some of the types of automation, um, and what I just showed was a simple script. Uh, there's no error checking whatsoever. If the database goes away, you're kind of screwed. Um, if the email piece, you know, doesn't work, then that, that's going to be a problem. They usually have minimal logging inside of them. Um, sometimes you can, you know, create a little extra logging in there so you know what's going on. Um, that would be awesome. And they're really fragile. Um, so any small change whatsoever. I mean, if, if you can't write to the temp directory, you're kind of screwed. If uh, you can't email out because the, uh, the mail server's gone, then yeah, that's gonna break. Some more complex scripts. Uh, usually have a little more error checking and correction. So again, you're talking about the process with the, uh, where it goes through and double checks all that stuff. You probably co uh, create a complex script for that particular thing. Uh, sufficient logging so that anyone can take a look in there. Sometimes you can do uh, things where it will email you whenever there's a problem. Um, so that may be something to check out. And the robust. You know, they can, take, they can take any kind of data, especially one that's 10 rows down. So that's some of the formal dis uh, things. Let's talk about a little more of the informal stuff, other types of automation <coughs> that we may not necessarily think of as automation. Aliases. I can't tell you how many times I've created an alias for something 
um, in my day-to-day -day work that allows me to do something that I don't have to type in these 10 cylinder commands in order to do. So take advantage of aliases. Um, a lot of the different shells have some kind of an alias to them. Definitely something to, to really check it out. Uh, a one-liner script. Um, even just a little small shell, shell script or something like that for something that you do all the time. Uh, Django has uh, some shell scripts and whatnot that I've been using lately. And one of them is to open it up so that you can, so you're not necessarily have to be on the same machine because I run it in a virtual machine. And I don't remember the command line for that at all. So I throw it in a little shell script. It's called, you know, start-server or something like that. And it's got all the command line stuff that I need in there in order to run the server the way that I want it to be run. So I don't have to think about it all the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in Git, um, so I have a configs directory uh, that I keep um, all that the aliases and all that other kind of stuff, and I have a little Python script that creates links into that particular directory. Um, so that's one way of doing it. For this particular thing, um, I usually just copy the script in there. This is a long running machine that I have, so it's basically it's going to be there for the duration of this particular machine. And if I have to recreate it, well, I have to recreate it. Um, I'm not going to be too upset about that. But yeah, that's, that's in this particular case. Cron jobs. Now, I know a lot of folks are really familiar with them, but I think sometimes we tend to reinvent cron badly um, over and over. Uh, so just, I would, I would highly recommend learning the syntax of cron, learning how cron works, and using that a lot more. Um, especially the at reboot. Um, I don't know how many folks know what at reboot is, but it's a cron entry where you can say, instead of the time, date, and all that other crap in front of it, you can say at reboot, and you can then put a script in there so that every time that your machine starts up, you automatically run this. And what's neat for that, so I don't know how many folks use Dropbox. Dropbox usually has it where it, um, you have to bring up a shell or a, a, a window manager in order to use it. But if you do at reboot, Dropbox start, it will automatically start that in the background. So you don't have to actually log into that machine and have a window manager running. Uh, it's a really handy tool, so it's, it's constantly running for you. Make files. Hey, there's a book about make. Funny that. Um, make is another thing that we tend to rewrite poorly. Um, and I'm not going to diss a whole bunch of the different tools that are out there, but there's a, like about a billion different ways for people to make stuff um, using make file type tools. But these can be really handy for a group of files that change that be, result in a single file. Um, and that can be anything from, you know, C based make files to something like uh, Pandoc. So I use Pandoc for uh, making a book. And so I have a lot of markdown files in a particular directory that I then combine together, which then creates not only the PDF file, but also the EPUB file off of that. I can show you that in a second. Um, I've got an older version of Pandoc, but just to pay no mind to that. Editor plugins. And I know a lot of you use editors in your day-to-day -day work. But there's some really cool things that you can do with editors. Some of those things include uh, templating code. So there's, um, in Vim, there's Utilisnips and Snipmate, which will allow you to um, type in just you know, something like class or something like that, and then tab, and it will put the rest of the uh, template in there. Really handy, especially if you're doing a lot of HTML development. And I, I can show you a bit of that, but it's just like, it is a godsend. Um, and there's also linting tools. Uh, I think there's Flake 8 and um, Syntastic that I use. I think Syntastic is the really big one because that uh, doesn't do just Python. And that uh, will go through and it will, I'm trying to remember exactly what I have it do offhand, but um, it will run through the script th that I'm running, the code that I'm running. And as I'm writing it, it will then show where the errors are in it. Um, and there's also things for, you know, showing all the change lines in a particular script. I can show links to all this stuff. It's easier, and, and this is unfortunately the hard part of this, is that there's a lot of stuff that I take for granted in my day-to-day -day work. 
and a lot of stuff that I've put and cobbled together in various, you know, files and such. So like my Vim RC, um, I would say I understand about 75% of it. Um, the rest of it is cobbled together from the internet and it's like this uh, t <laughs> teetering tower that I dare not <laughs> move anything out of or things will break horribly. Um, and that's oh, another disadvantage too of, of that's a disadvantage of some of the automation stuff sometimes is that if you don't really understand what it is that you're doing, you can run yourself into some big problems. But I'm not going to get too far into that rabbit hole. You said four VIM things up there. Could you repeat those? Sorry? You said four VIM. Four VIM things. Uh, Syntastic, S-Y-N-T-A-S-T-I-C. You know what? Let me just do this. <clears throat> So these are the plugins that I run for Vim. Is that big enough? Mm, there's a lot there. there there's a, again, there is a boatload there. Um, so I've got stuff like, uh, da, da, da. of course, it's on the other screen. Um, Vim Fugitive, Snippets, Snipmate, Utila Snips. Um, I'll use all of those, Snip, Snip, Snip. Uh, control P, I use that for um, file management, and I can show a little bit about that. Uh, what happens if you get out of box from one of your plugins and those are pissed? Uh, I, I am not nearly as effective when my plugins aren't there. Uh, vinegar, super tab, uh, there's a to do text them thing, buffer explorer. I'll go over some of this stuff, I'll, I'll show a quick demo of this stuff in a second. But yeah, I mean, at the very least, if you're using a programming text editor, understand some of the things that you can do with it. And at the very least, go, go out to Google or DuckDuckGo or any of these places and say, you know, I want to do templating or I want to do this particular task. Are there any plugins out there that are going to help me be more effective? And what I would what I would caution is that yes, you can get into some real rabbit holes where you get all sorts of plugins that start stepping on each other's toes and start messing around with with everything. But try and come up with some things where it's doing some of the work for you and that you're not doing all this tedious stuff like writing an HTML file from scratch, that sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. Figure out, yeah, I can trust uh, part of it is uh, institutional knowledge. So I'm not the first person to discover all of this stuff. There's a lot of other folks that are looking at these same things. Okay. Um, so that would be one one approach. Is you know, there's a lot of people who trust this stuff, so I could probably trust it too. That said, yes, you can get into some instances like the Node.js stuff, where one person goes rogue and then everyone's trust gets violated. That's unfortunately something that can happen with any of these things. Um, one of the other things that I do with this though is I try and find the ones that do one thing and do one thing well. So there are a lot of, there, there's a tendency to try and come up with a Swiss Army knife type thing where you just you know throw it all into one particular plugin and that particular thing does this whole bundle of stuff. Um, and I would say I try and shy away from some of those plugins um, but on the same token there are some where they do a whole lot of stuff I think Syntastic in particular does a whole bunch of stuff and Jedi does a whole bunch of stuff as well but they do one particular thing that I like well <coughs> I'm guessing you've never been burnt badly by this not that I'm aware of <laughs> <laughs> and again it's 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 a trust thing so and and not to get too far into the weeds of this stuff but you, you, there's a certain level of trust that you have to employ in order to do any kind of automation. You have to trust that you're going to be able to, to go up and use this particular stuff. You need to trust that something bad is not going to happen. Because, you know, there's the, um, 
the scene in The Sorcerer's Apprentice from Fantasia uh, where you know something bad happens when he's doing the automation stuff and he starts breaking things apart and it goes completely a haywire. If you're not careful, you can create some very wonderful things that go through and go completely haywire on your system. You have to trust yourself in order to be and test this stuff. You know, if you don't test this stuff, then yes, you're going to run into trouble. Yes. Right. Flashlight programs and everything being, you know, bad actors. So mm -hmm. Same thing. You know, you've got an ecosystem that that's the you know that that's the plugins, and then you trust those plugins, and it can always go bad. Right. But you know, rarely probably does it. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, and 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 two, I don't think the Vim ecosystem is going to be heavily targeted by advertisers anytime soon. Um, that tends to be where f folks tend to you know, do a lot of bad acting in that. And I, I know that's a bit of a, a non sequitur and whatnot, but <coughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's fine. No, I understand. Again, you're, you're going to have to figure out what your trust levels are on this stuff. And if you want to vet the code, the code's out there. If you want to take a look at it, understand what Vim script is, you can do that. All right. Uh, let's pop back over here. Alrighty. Why are you not working? Okay. Well, you know what? Let's do some demos here. Because uh, my slide presentation just went haywire. Uh, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, <coughs> so what I had in there uh, was a list of things that I tend to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was just going off the top of my head just to think of what it is that I do um, and what I do that gets automated. Let me try and see if I can get this to work one more time. Hey, there you are. Scrolling down, finding slide. So these are some scripts that I run and some of them that I wrote. And uh, one of those is the, um, the announcement list, script. List. Um, so there is a uh, script that I run on my computer that checks the mugs website, the mug website and checks the iCal file and figures out if there's a particular date um, that is 14 days in the future and is, if it is then it will email to the uh, the mug mailing list and say hey here's the making the meeting that's coming up um, there's some recur uh, to do text stuff that I have in there uh, random background changer I found off of the internet and uh, kind of adapted for my own needs uh, some various backup scripts that I have I don't know how many people, you know, do their regular backup hygiene or whatnot, but if you're not doing your backup hygiene, uh, that may be something to automate uh, sooner than later. Uh, I have a birthday manager. So my cousins and a lot of folks um, have, have many, many children, and I love them all very dearly, but sometimes I have a, a hard time remembering who's related to who. Um, and I have been caught flat-footed on several times of emailing the wrong cousin and saying happy birthday to your child uh, who is not yours, it happens to be the other ones. Uh, so I had um, a birthday manager, B-D-A-Y-D, which was written in Perl, um, that I used for a while until I ran into some issues with it where it would show the wrong birthday and the wrong day, um, which is always a fun thing. And it didn't have relationships, and so I rewrote it uh, in Python so that it will show me not only their age, but who they're related to. And so I can go, yay, all right. I will send out an email to my cousin and let them know happy birthday to your child. Um, their children are now like in their 13th and older and whatnot. So anyways, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, reminders for my podcast, Open Metal Cast. So um, I try and do it twice weekly and trying to get anything um, in any calendaring application to do twice weekly and let you know which episode that it is that you're working on uh, is not very easy to do. So I wrote my own reminder application. Uh, something else that creates show notes um, for Open Metal Cast. So I use Audacity and um, I get the information out of that. Um, I can show you that if you, if you really care to. RSS to email. I wish more folks used RSS because RSS is an amazing protocol. Um, and what I do, so when Google Reader uh, went down, you know, evaporated from the world, uh, I changed back over to using RSS in my email client. And what this does is it sends, it goes through a whole list of uh, RSS feeds and emails me whenever there's a change to those. Yeah, but I also have proc mail so that that stuffs it all into an RSS file so that I don't have to worry about it. And I don't subscribe to a whole lot of high traffic stuff. I mean, I subscribe to Reddit via RSS, which God love you if you do. Um, it doesn't have everything, uh, but yeah, you get some interesting stuff. Uh, SSH tunneling script. So I, I run a, um, a tunnel for my proxying on my computer. And rather than remember all those commands, I just have a little script that does this stuff. Um, I also have one that'll bring up my uh, squeeze box player on this uh, machine so that I can listen to my remote library as needed. And some scripts in that to sync my, la my laptop up with my home machine. I use rsync um, for certain things. Like I have my whole book library. I carry that around with me um, and such. But yeah, there's, there's different scripts for that stuff. So let me talk about some of this stuff. Uh, any of those these scripts look interesting? Anybody want to just do dealer's choice on this? No? Sorry, Python birthday manager. Python birthday manager. Thank you. Thank you, random person in the audience. <laughs> You're welcome, random presenter. <laughs> we have never met before. <laughs> Okay, so this is my birthday manager, and I'll just run it. So it has uh, various commands. Um, it does it has yeah add email import file, uh, which basically imported the B day B format, uh, listing today and then upcoming. So let me do a slightly canned uh, example so I don't accidentally leak people's uh, birthdays on the internet. <laughs> so there's an upcoming birthday here for a foo user uh, the relationship they're a test user current age is 49 and uh, it's one day until their birthday so happy birthday test user tomorrow uh, there's also uh, I decided to throw Linus Torvalds in there because why not uh, his birthday is coming up at the end of the year. He'll be 50. Uh, right now he's 49. Uh, and it's 319 days, so you have a little bit of shopping time before his birthday, before his 50th birthday. That's going to be fun, isn't it? <laughs> so if I wanted to add a birthday here, uh, let's say another test user. Event date. Let's say it's 2017 one because I'm not creative with this test user. All right. So then if I list it again, so that's added in here. Now, you may ask yourself, what exactly is all happening in the back end on this? I'm glad you asked. Uh, that is, I think it's under here. Here it is. It's all a Python script. Uh, it was partly for me to play around with something called SQL Alchemy. Uh, SQL Alchemy is an ORM, uh, Object Relational Manager, for Python. And so there's several different files here. 
the database itself is stored in uh, my configuration area. It's a SQLite database. Uh, before BDAD used like a text file, and I probably could have used a text file for this, but I decided I like databases better um, for this, so why not? Uh, you'll note that it doesn't have a delete function in there. That's because I wrote it for me, and so if I wanted to go in and delete something, I'll just go into the database and delete it, uh, which I probably will with all those test users that I created in there. So this is also something that you can use automation for, is to try out different things. So if you have a particular task and you have a particular language that you want to use, why not use that particular thing? Um, one thing that I didn't highlight that I probably should, uh, the idea, so some folks will use something like a shell script and they'll use very large shell scripts and they'll use variables in shell scripts and if statements in shell scripts. I'm not sure about you, but any time that I've had to do an if statement or a variable or any kind of like string concatenation in bash and shell scripts, I want to hurt myself and it's just, it's, my, my rule of thumb is if it's over 10 lines, throw it in a programming language. That's not necessarily um, a hard and fast rule, but it's definitely where I start getting itchy is when it starts getting large and it starts getting into having a whole bunch of different conditionals or a whole bunch of different variables. Now, your comfort level may be much better than mine uh, for shell scripting, and if that is the case, then by all means, knock yourselves out. But So in my cron job, is this. So every morning, uh, one minute after midnight, it will send me an email. And that email uh, will show all of the different birthdays that are upcoming. I'm not going to show you all that because unfortunately it also does it 14 days out and there are some relatives and friends that have birthdays that are coming up. But it will go through and it will show me how, how far out they are and when it's coming up so that I can have enough time to, to buy a present or just, you know, to say happy birthday, send you know, a send a card, whatever. No, but does anybody send cards anymore? Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Very cool. People remember you if you send them a physical card. Mm. That's why I don't send it's physical fine. cards. I don't want to be remembered. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. To handwrite them through. Yeah. It doesn't So I mentioned Dropbox. Uh, so I have, uh, in, as reboot, um, every time that my machine reboots, it will bring out the Dropbox daemon. Um, so if you have like a headless machine or something like that, that's really handy. So every time the thing powers up, boom, you're already on Dropbox. Um, as opposed to having this little thing right up here. And it's one thing that you do lose, but I'm over it. Uh, let's see, some other automation. <coughs> you said I will go to Dropbox even though the icon is not active. Is that right? Yeah, okay. so it's it's all synced up and okay. it's still working and such. Can you, write a, can you write a script to enable the status icon? I probably could, <laughs> if I cared. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's one little other piece of automation. Um, let me show this here. So you'll note this snazzy background back here. Uh, let me enable something very tricksy. Uh, if I can do this. <coughs> Alright. So I have a, I mentioned the script that I use for doing random pictures and whatnot. And it is conveniently called, let me bring up a terminal here, I'm going to drag it over here. Remember, friend, this is why you do not do dual monitors <laughs> for a presentation. So I'll type the script in here. Uh, random pick. Uh, of course it isn't going to do that because I need to do that here. Yes, this is a canned, canned demo. Um, so if I type random pick, <laughs> so there we go. 
So what I have, and, I, and I'm being a little cheeky with what I'm doing here. So I aliased a random pick to the actual script, which is random picture, mm -hmm. and I give it the name of the picture that I want it to do um, by default. And what that script looks like, uh, it's a little more complex. Uh, it still has GNOME 2 code in there, so yay. Um, but this is something that I, I b borrowed from the internet. Um, and what this will do is this will go through and figure out a, uh, an image for you for your day-to-day -day stuff. So if you wanted to go through, <laughs> it's, it's a little complex, but it, it'll, it'll go through and, and pick a random picture and whatnot. And sometimes I'll just, you know, from a directory of pictures, yeah. So not just a random picture from the internet? It's not going on no, not a random picture from the internet. <laughs> Dear God, no. <laughs> no. You have an RSS feed for Yeah, I have an RSS feed, but I'm not stupid. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, I would, what's that? Does GNOME have the ability to randomize your? It probably does, but the thing is, I can also sit in front of my terminal and just type R-A-N-D, hit tab, and then boom, I have an, a randomized picture. And I don't have to wait for it to do it. I don't have to go into all the settings and such in order to get that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yes? So a lot of this stuff has reminded me of a time where I was working at an auto company, mm -hmm. and engineers thought they were good at automating things. Yes. Um, and then you end up with people that don't know that there's actually like a for loop in that lab. Yeah. And then you get a lot, file that's 32,000 lines long. Yes. Um, so how do you manage these people? and Or how do you ensure that the right people are doing the automation? That is the eternal question. I don't think there's a good answer for that. Um, because anytime, and, and let, me, let me give an apocryphal tale. Uh, and, uh, and only apocryphal because uh, I don't want to give any names of where it was and when this happened. So apocryphal tale of <coughs> one of the places that I worked at had uh, a gentleman who had the most amazing Excel spreadsheet I think I had ever seen in my life. This thing was tied together in I would say at least 10 different other Excel spreadsheets. It grabbed data from all of these things and he used it for managing a particular thing that a particular company would really enjoy managing um, and it was the both the most horrifying and amazing thing I think I have ever seen in my life horrifying because it was all done in Excel and they all used Excel macros and whatnot which I would never touch with a 10-foot pole and amazing because it was just this solid thing. I mean, it, it literally ground his machine to halt any time that he ran this particular thing, but it did what he needed it to do. So I wouldn't necessarily say, yes, you know, don't, if, if someone doesn't understand programming, then they shouldn't necessarily do automation because people who don't necessarily know what it is that they're doing also don't have the limitations of not knowing what it is that they're doing. And so they will create some amazing things. They don't know what they can't do, exactly. So, yes, they may not understand what a for loop is. And another apocryphal tale and another apocryphal place is uh, I saw a, it's just not apocryphal when you say you say it, <laughs> when you say you saw it, is it? Um, I saw another instance where there was this program that was written in Visual Basic. And the person who wrote it did not understand what a wire clause was. And so they had created a nested loop, no joke about yay long, physically on the screen, that looped through. And as soon as it found whatever piece of data, it would then exit out of that loop and then pop up, roll through this, exit, roll through this, exit, roll through this. And again, it ground the machine to a halt whenever there was it was trying to find a large, you know, the last piece of data in those for loops. It would just grind the machine to a halt. So, yes, I've seen amazing things and I've seen horrifying things when people are doing programming. 
do I know the difference? Do I know if some, you know, s sitting here now, do I know if someone is going to create amazing, horrible code, or are they going to just create horrible, horrible code? I don't know, and I don't think it's not, it's possible to really know that up front. Now that said, if you are in a position to help such person, you know, modify their code, maybe you can help them create something better off of this stuff, and maybe you can help them understand the, the bits that are you know they don't understand as far as programming but I'm not going to say to someone you don't understand you know how a for loop works you don't understand what a while is and that so you don't get the benefits of automation sorry it's like you know if if, if they have the will to do that I'm going to try not to stand in their way in order to do that okay. I'm just thinking like if they just had some you know programmer there to cater to some of their stuff to help them out or even just review what they were doing. Yeah. That would have been like hugely helpful. Oh yeah, and no, definitely. It, it's kind of weird to me that there aren't really, if you're a big company, how do you not have just like programmer on call to help out all your office people right. to do all their stuff or review it well, or whatever. And I, and I can't tell you how many times I was involved in an organization where we were considered shadow IT. Because we were, you know, the, the, the programmers that they hired that weren't necessarily part of the big group of programmers that they hired in a different department. Um, so, yeah, big corporations have a really hard time with hiring people to do stuff like automation because they just, they hired, you know, like, okay, I'm just going to flat out say it. A lot of the automotive companies in this area hire engineers first. They don't hire necessarily programmers first. And so engineers are about getting stuff done. They're about taking whatever it is that they need to, do to get done and do it. And they may not necessarily have the, the computer science background <coughs> or the programming background to say there's probably a better way to do this. But on the same <coughs> token, if they are leveraging a tool in order to get their work done and they're doing it in such a way that they're continually, you know, if, at the very least, if they, if they have the understanding that they can do something like this repetitively and have it continually do what it is that they need to do, you know, that's awesome. I mean, that's usually more than a lot of people do. A lot of times I've seen folks where it's like they're sitting in front of a multi-thousand dollar computer and they're, they're sitting there with their HP calculator tapping away on it. And it's like, first off, I love HP calculators, but on the same token, you have a very large piece of equipment that does, you know, spreadsheets and all this other kind of stuff. So use the technology. And and I think that's that's one thing that I would love to stress to people as far as automation and that is that use the technology that you have available to you in order to get your jobs done. If you have something that you can if it just takes just a small <coughs> shift in your thinking to get it to where it is where you're able to get something running repetitively and do the work, the mundane stuff that you're doing throughout your day. Like RSS feeds, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on those for a second because how many folks go and it's like the first thing that they do in their day is they bring up 50 tabs of all the stuff that they want to check throughout the day. It's like that is ludicrous to me that you would do that, especially on news sites or any of these other stuff. It's like, if you have RSS feeds, then you have a way to automate this stuff. There is an export mechanism available to you in order to check the status of those particular sites. Now, not every site does that. Like, if you wanted to check someone's Twitter or, or some, you know, game store or something like that that happens to be local that doesn't have an RSS feed, you're relying on, you're going to have to go and visit that particular thing. You're going to have to find other means in order to get that information out of there. But a lot of sites do offer RSS feeds, so you can use those things. Craig, yeah. Craig <coughs> you're, um, if you're automating your personal stuff, which a lot of you, what you talked about is, then yes. uh, your stuff is your stuff, and if, if mm -hmm. you just weren't there one day, then nobody else would do it, and, and the world would be fine. But you're using some of this stuff for automating company business. Mm-hmm. I graduate, yeah. Yeah, you graduate or, you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> um, it seems to me like I've seen a lot of cases 
where all of a sudden um, there's a problem because yes. nobody else knows how to do it. Nobody else knows that it's being done. Uh, the strips that you use, I know you were talking about using get form, that would be spectacular. Very seldom did, have I seen anybody have the uh, uh, strips in, uh, in repositories. They're usually just on there if they get changed. <coughs> Who knows yeah. what they were before. Um, how do you manage that so that, uh, I mean, because, you know, it, you say, well, I just put it in Vim with these plugins, and all right. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, yeah. I'll go find somebody else to step in and do that when you're not there, and they'll, they'll right. look at it and say, I'm a Windows person. What the hell? Well, so, so that that does get to one of the downsides of engine of another one of the downsides of automation and that is that you bring anytime that you automate something you bring something to whatever it is that you're automating you bring yourself to whatever it is that you're automating and you bring your skill sets and whatnot to whatever it is that you're automating and there have been times yes when I have uh, graduated from companies for various reasons or whatnot where my machine suddenly becomes the sacred ground and that machine does this particular thing and it does this particular thing in perpetuity and verily no one shall touch yea, yea verily no one shall touch this machine because we don't understand what it is that it does I don't know a way to fix that unfortunately the only way that I know to, to alleviate some of that is to document what it is that you're doing and make sure that un other people understand what it is that you're doing. But institutional knowledge, I mean, that's, that's been a problem, I think, since the, the very first time that someone powered up a mainframe and then walked away from it. That's, that's been a problem for, forever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, what we started doing um, on my team is uh, the first phase, I think, is really getting source control on everything that you do. Mm -hmm. And before you can roll anything out, it has to go through peer review and a pull request so that someone else has seen that code, knows it's there and what it does, and it's approved <coughs> that it's valid code that won't bring everything to a halt. Right. Uh, or at least there's two people that are not responsible rather than just, just you. Well, and then it's two people that can forget as opposed to one. Yeah. <laughs> That's what but, usually um, happens. At least you have a, a source of truth, which is source control. And always, you know, inline yeah. documentation whenever possible is always helpful. Mm -hmm. And, and <laughs> that's one of the points that I was trying to make is that for certain things like aliases, for certain things like one-line shell scripts and that, it's so that you don't have to remember this stuff. You can just use your muscle memory to remember. Like changing my background, I could do that. You know, there are very myriad ways of doing that. But all I have to do is type in a few characters, and boom, my my background has changed. And yes, is that a silly thing to automate? Probably, but it's something that makes me happy. I can go in there, type in a command, and then boom, I get some results off of it. So, it brings me joy. Yes? Yeah, a, a lot of times, uh, things that could be automated don't get automated because the people who are dealing with the work don't know enough about the automation to know that they, c or, or the, the uh, internals of what's available to know that a process could be automated. Exactly. And so uh, when I used to work for NVD mainframe uh, computer operations uh, in print, we had these laser printers that were about as long as they, they had stage before the ramp and uh, as, as tall and wide as a refrigerator. And uh, uh, they wanted, uh, as we became part of Bank One, they wanted Every little job, whether it was that tall or or five stacks that tall, logged on a sheet mm -hmm. so that they could build the user departments for the number of pages 
that they had printed. Yeah. So anyway, uh, my brain went to work and I said, wait a minute. On the console log, mm -hmm. every time a printout starts, job number, name of the job, number of lines of printout, so on and so forth. So uh, I talked to uh, one of the, the systems programmers who optimizes the system. Oh yeah, since you can get that in data, <coughs> and mm -hmm. we can filter it out so only the stuff is there. Went from there to an analyst into a spreadsheet, bingo, job done. Right, exactly. So as opposed to having someone sit there, one, two, three, you know, you have that information available to you. Right, and instead of logging these little, little five page long jobs, mm -hmm. hundreds of them, yeah. as, as well as the big ones, on, on a sheet, that's very intensive labor. Yeah. Gee, these jobs are getting out late because people are writing this stuff down. Right, exactly. Now, another example is we had uh, overdraft notices. Overdraft notices have to get out right away. They have to be sent out by first class mail. But you can save a ton of money on first class mail if you use a, uh, uh, a mail processing company because they uh, put every mail together and they pre-sort it by zip code and the post office gives you uh, a terrifically good rate. Well, they moved up the deadline by two hours. So, <laughs> which is, here's the issue though. It has to be sorted, these overdraft notices, by foreign, international, by right. non-mail, people pick them up at the branches, mm -hmm. and by regular U.S. mail. Yeah, exactly. This is done manually by hand. Well, there's <coughs> software on the mainframe yeah. from a third-party software that called Express. Went to the analyst, before you know it, three piles. There you go. See, and that's... So there's, there's some material benefit to automation. I mean, you, you can take a look at any company and it's like, okay, you know, here's, we're, we're paying someone to do this particular task. How can we do it better? But in the same token, it doesn't necessarily have to have a dollar amount associated with it. It can also have a mental dollar amount, if you will. You know, the mental cost of doing this particular thing. So one of the things that we did, uh, we used to do a lot, is send out an announcement mail to the announced mailing list to let everyone know when the next meeting was. That was a mental cost because someone had to remember to do this. Someone had to remember to copy all this stuff into an email message and then send it over to the announced mailing list. One of the things that we did beforehand was we used uh, Civic CRM, RSS, and RSS to email. So RSS to email would, I had a separate RSS to email instance set up where it would take the RSS feed whenever the meeting was posted and then shove that over into the announced mailing list. One of the downsides of that is that if we had more than one meeting scheduled, we would have to then hold off on posting any of those things, hold off on putting any of those things in there because it would then send everything in there. So then you would be getting, if it was January, you'd be getting February, March, and April's meetings in January where you can do nothing really about it. If you, you know, yes, you can plan out, you know, three months in advance, but when March came around, it's like, where's the announce? Where's the reminder? Where's all that stuff? So what I did with this is I used, um, I used some, uh, some modules from Python to grab the iCal format. And grab, um, I think I used requests as well in there, maybe not. Or my, uh, yeah, no, I'd use, I use URL live request and grab the, uh, the event. So that's the, the URL for the event stuff. And I went through and parsed through it and then figured out how many days out a particular event was in the future. And when that was figured out, I would then send it over to meeting name, you know, to get the meeting name off of that, figure out the from, which is basically my email address and then uh, send it over to announce at mug.org. So boom, it would send that over as soon as it was 14 days out in advance. And in the cron for this, because I don't want to have to remember to do this. Uh, 
こと<笑> I'm going to leak a little bit. So there's one for、um, backing up the website. It's a shell script that I run.、Um, but there's also an iCal, the iCal thing in there. So at 7 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter which day it is, because、um, I don't want to have to figure out how,、um, you know, run it on a particular Tuesday or something like that. Basically, it runs once a day, downloads the iCal format, figures out if it's in that particular time frame, and then shoots it out. So. That's one way of doing some automation. Again, it's something that I don't have to remember. I don't have to remember to send out the meeting notice. All I have to do is just put the events into the Civis CRM, and then boom, they show up in the announced mailing list. One less thing to worry about, which is nice. Are there any other questions? Yeah. This is more of a comment for Cron.、Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with it.、Um, Are you going to make me try and explain Cron? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And so、yes. it says, this is what this column means. Yeah. And so instead of having to try to, try to figure it out each time, it's, it's just available on each cron. And so it just, it's just there, and you can just, oh, I want it on Monday, put a one there. Yeah. Or I want it to run every day.、Um, so it's, it's just a, a small little key at the top that, that helps out. And then it's kind of like automation, except for it's just a template. Yeah, exactly. Again, it's, it's one less thing that you have to remember. And one less thing, you know, so you don't have to go, okay,、uh, man, cron tab,、uh, man, cron tab. Tab. Uh, oh, it's not, oh, that's not the right one. Yeah,、uh, it's、uh, which? Five, five, yeah, five. Okay.、Uh, is that where? No.、Uh, it, see? That way, then you don't have to go through all of that remembering <coughs> in order to get there. Yes? So, are there like cron managers and trackers? Probably. I'm sure that there are. <laughs> <laughs> there has to be. So, it's like there's got to be something where it's like, okay, this cron job ran here and it knows when it ran there. Yeah. And again, this is. This is well, it, it'll, it'll send an email generally if there's any output when it runs,、um, which you can take advantage of as well. And we could probably have a whole talk about cron at some point. You could do massive overkill and、mm -hmm. put it in Jenkins. Yeah, it, but, yeah you, can, you could do that if you wanted to do that. Yeah, that is an option.、Um, I, I did promise、uh, one thing here. So I do a podcast. And. There, there are several scripts that I do in order to run this particular podcast. The first one is、uh, one that I call Create JSON. So if I go into my music directory here, what this will do is this will create a JSON file of all of the music that's in there. So it reads all of the music files and then puts that into a JSON format, which I can then edit. And you'll notice some of the things in there, like license. The URI and all that other kind of stuff. Those are the things that I, I care about for editing. But one of the other things that I use this for, so there's another script that I have called OMC Notes. And it'll do、uh, dash A is the Audacity file, dot EUP, and then dot J is the playlist file right here. And what this will do is this will generate for me. Show notes. So I have all the show notes that go into an episode. And what it, this go, does is it goes through the Audacity file.、Um, if you look at the .eup <coughs> file, you have all of this information in XML. And if you go through all this information in XML, you can figure out where the position is of a particular file inside of that Audacity file. So, I can then figure out what the, what the position is, which then becomes this piece here, where I can figure out the exact time where it is in that particular file. And so I can then put it together with the notes. 
I also have the license information because I run a Creative Commons license podcast. I need the license information in there. And I have a link to where the folks can get that grabbed out of the comments field of the file. I also have the handy dandy section right here, which lets me take a look. You know, I can read all this stuff directly off of this, or I can pop it into for Club Metal. I can pop that all directly into a speech synthesizer so that it can speak that entire block right there. And then I also have this here, which uses a, I, I think I wrote something that was the Oxford comma, which basically figures out if you do, you know, one or two, one, two, three, and blah, 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 it'll do that. And so then I can copy that into the episode itself. Again, things that I don't necessarily have to do, I don't have to remember, I can script all of this stuff together and then boom, I can then create a podcast. Because if I had to do all this stuff by hand, if I had to do all this stuff manually, I would not do any of this stuff because it wouldn't be fun anymore. And there's also another one. I'm not going to demonstrate it here. I think I can cat it, though. Uh, make show. Where it will go through. I think this is just a simple <coughs> shell script. Yeah, it's a shell script. Yep. And does all the things that I need to do uh, to create an episode and runs OMC notes on it as well. Da, 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 and I think it does editing on it too. I'm trying to remember. Um, but it will do the lame encoding and it will do the aug encoding and it will wait for both of them to stop. So it will fork both of those off together so that the encoding will happen. As soon as they're both done, boom. It then uh, pulls up some tagging stuff that I have for creating the tags for it tags both of the episodes in there. And then I run the create JSON, it'll create the playlist. Um, I can via vim the playlist again, and then boom, there it goes. And I think that actually doesn't work the way that I expected it to work, because it doesn't actually write into the playlist. <laughs> That's awesome. <sighs> nice to find dead code <laughs> in a live <laughs> demo. What RSS yes. aggregator do you use? RSS to email. RSS to email. Yes. Okay. So RSS to email. Why do you use that versus any of these other ones there? Uh, I use it because it's still being developed, number one. Um, the second thing is that I can read my RSS in MUT, and I can read it in Thunderbird. And so I don't have to necessarily worry about running a separate client for it um, and a separate server for it, because I'm already running a mail server. So I can show a little bit of what that well, you know, let me, do, let me bring up the tab first over here so I can make sure that there's nothing weird in my email. <coughs> yeah, this is good. That'll work. All right. So this is what my RSS feed looks like. And it's basically in MUT. Um, the Internet Archive, for whatever reason, I, I subscribe to the Unlocked Archive, um, Unlocked Albums, which they're not necessarily public domain, but they're abandoned albums, so they make them available. And I want to see which ones of them show up. Unfortunately, the way that the, um, the feed is, is that I think any time that there's a small change, it does every one of those. And so there's a boatload of them that are in there. But it's really fun to check out. Uh, so you can get like a copy of the uh, Symphony Number no. 8. Um, I don't remember which conductor it was. But anyways, that's something fun to check out. Um, but yeah, so my RSS feed, uh, R2E. Um, I do something that Google probably doesn't like. Oh. Whoa, there we go. <sighs> I knew that was going to happen at some point. Uh, so YouTube allows you to get the RSS feeds of your subscriptions, and that. And so I did it. There we go. So they allow you to get the um, subscriptions off or an RSS feed. So you get an OPML export off of that. So then you can import that into your RSS reader. And so I have all of my YouTube subscriptions in my RSS reader. So that anytime something changes, instead of having to have, you know, click on a little bell or 
you know, log into YouTube, I can get all of those subscriptions in a handy dandy RSS format. And so then I can take a look at any of those videos that I care to look at, or I can just go, you know, I don't care about this, I don't care about this, which is generally what happens. But <laughs> it's one less site for me to visit in my day to day experience. So let me. Da -da 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 -da. my mouse cursor <clears throat> so that's a list of all of the uh, different RSS feeds that I subscribe to for YouTube um, there's a few others and I don't want to necessarily leak out my reddit key um, so that's why I'm being a little more circumscribed the, no, these are the ones that I, I follow oh, okay. online. Yeah, so if I do RTE li, uh, list. So there's a few of the things that I follow, like Gaming on Linux and Linux Journal Podcast uh, as well. And just so that Tony can be happy. Tony and Tom. You know, I follow SMLR as well. Yes? So uh, do you have any tools <laughs> I've been trying to get better at using uh, Journal, which is a journaling application. Um, I think it's written in Python, if I recall correctly. Uh, but what you can do with this, so you can see how well I've done for today. Uh, but it will show you uh, a list of all the things that you've done in that um, on that particular day. You can give it a date range as well. And it's all in a text file. So if you're not really good about figuring out date ranges and that, you can also do grep in it. Yeah, I, I have a high bias towards text files because grep is my friend. Um, and grep finds many things that I don't necessarily remember all the time. Uh, and with that, I think that's about, all. oh, let me show you Vim, just so you can have a taste of what this is. So I'm going to create an HTML file Called foo. I'm going to wrap this up real quick because I know we need to get out of here very shortly. So, how many times has this happened to you? Where you're sitting there typing in an HTML document, it's like Ugh, HTML, da da da. Wouldn't it be better if you had something like this? HTML, you hit tab, and boom, everything shows up like that. Or, body div so it throws in the class name in there or if you happen to be a python programmer ever have this happen to you so you can type in my class do a def down here if you want you can edit this, these strings so if you want to change it from my class to foo class It'll automatically update the doc string there. Is that what your Vim plugins? Yes. Yes. I'm sure that allows you to create your own snips as well. Yeah. It's, uh, it's Utila snips that I'm using. And what's nice about this, too, so uh, you'll see down here, I'm automatically running PEP8 on my code. So if I delete that and I delete this, there's no errors in here any longer. Yeah, so print, hello world. It'll show me um, all the arguments for that particular command. Uh, it'll also show me syntax errors, if there are syntax errors. So let's say I, I leave it like this. Yeah, there's a blank line at the end of the file, but I think it's also a syntax error. But because it's a blank line at the end of the file, yeah, there you go. It's an invalid syntax right there. So if I add that, 
Oh, whoa, hey, ah, uh, pandemonium. There we go, back to normal. And if I'm in Git, in a uh, project with Git, uh, let me create one in temp here. So, maker foo. What was the thing that had it show the edits? What was that plugin called? That shows the edits? Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's airline or fugitive, one of the two. <laughs> Again, some of this is institutional knowledge <laughs> at this point. Um, yeah, well, it's basically, I found it and it's in my Vim RC and that's, that, that holds all the information that I need. Is your Vim RC in your uh, public GitHub? Yes, it is. Or it will be. Um, <laughs> Whoops. All right. So I'm just going to create a real quick canned example here. And I'm going to, you know, if you're ever doing a presentation and you're, uh, you don't mirror your screens, mm -hmm. I highly recommend mirroring your screens at some point because otherwise you're doing it. Mm -hmm. All right, git add foo. So git commit <coughs> initial. All right, so I'll say add something here. Uh, print adding a line. Of course, it's not going to do it. All right. No, no, I didn't add. There we go. So now it'll show me that I've added a line there as well, which can be really handy when you're figuring out what you've added to a particular file and what you haven't added to a file. With that, it also. Go ahead. Because you're, you're under Git control? I'm under Git control. Okay. So it'll also show me, and I don't think you can see it in this particular. With what I've got in the master branch, so you can see down at the very bottom, possibly that there's a master branch down there, and it'll show you what branch you're on. Whatever branch you yeah, out of. yeah, and I will post links to all the information that I have, um, either in, I'll put it with the presentation as well, but I'll also publish it to the discuss mailing list as well. So we can add it to the. We can add it to the, the description and all that other kind of stuff as well. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. Um, very much. Thank you. Thank you.